from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. It's wonderful to be here with Lisa C. in person. We have an unusual relationship. Every week for almost 10 years, I've talked to Lisa's mom, who was the book critic, Carolyn C. Many of you have read her for decades in the Washington Post. She just retired earlier this month. It was a tremendous loss, and I begged her to stay. As soon as we're done here, Carolyn wants me to call and tell her how it went. Uh, <clears throat> Inspired by her own family's history, Lisa C. has made her career writing about China and Chinese Americans. Her great-grandfather came to America in the mid-19th century, and like a lot of Chinese men who made that voyage, he arrived with nothing. But he eventually became the richest man in Los Angeles Chinatown. That fascinating history became the subject of her first book, a best-selling memoir called On Gold Mountain, The 100-Year Odyssey of My Chinese American Family. She went on to write a trilogy of very successful mysteries about a Chinese inspector and an American attorney. And in 2005, she published a gorgeous historical novel called Snowflower and the Secret Fan about the intense relationship <laughs> between two Chinese girls who communicate on a secret script used only by women. She's since published four more novels, including her most recent bestseller, an historical novel called China Dolls. Writing in the Washington Post, our reviewer called China Dolls an emotional, informative, and brilliant page turner that resonates with resilience and humanity. Lisa will be available to sign books at 5 o'clock, and at 8 o'clock, she'll be participating in our new Great Books to Great Movies discussion, hosted by the Washington Post film critic Ann Hornaday. Please join me in welcoming Lisa C. Thank you so much, Ron. You know, my mother has worked for him for such a long time, and when my mom had her 80th birthday, Ron sent, um, uh, 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 what would you call that, you know, like the nice, the nice words to read at the party, which I did read, and I wish I could repeat it to here today, but it was um, things I could never say in public, and certainly not forever for the Library of Congress thing. <laughs> But maybe later you can come up, I'll whisper it into your ear. Uh, so last night I was here and we had a party for all of the authors. And I can't tell you how many times people came up and said, so why do you write about China? Why do you write about the Chinese experience? And one woman at dinner said, how many times do people ask you that? And I thought, you know, just last night it was about 10. So I thought maybe before I get into the main part of my talk, I'd talk a little bit about my background. I grew up in a very large Chinese-American family in Los Angeles. I have about 400 relatives. Um, uh, on the, my father's side of the family, there are about a dozen that look like me, the majority still full Chinese in this little spectrum in between. So how did this come to me? As Ron mentioned, my great-great-grandfather came to this country to work on the building of the Transcontinental Railroad. Uh, I like to think of this man as one of the original deadbeat dads. You were supposed to come here, work hard, save up your money, and send it back home to China. Not my great-great-grandfather. He had a fondness for women and gambling, um, something that continues in our family even today. <laughs> and as a result, his wife, my great-great-grandmother, was so poor that she used to carry people on her back from village to village to earn money to support her children. Finally, some people took pity on her and lent my great-grandfather, Fong Si, who was only 14 years old, the money to come to the United States, what the Chinese call the Gold Mountain. Now, by this time, the railroad was completed. He found his father working in Sacramento. He said, you know, Dad, you're a bum. Go home. And he did. And my great-grandfather stayed and did a lot of the jobs that immigrants do even today. He worked in the fields. He swept up in factories. He... Um, worked in restaurants, washing dishes. But by the time he was 30, in the 1880s, in Sacramento, he had his first business. It was a factory that manufactured crotchless underwear for brothels. <laughs> I had to watch. <laughs> I hope you will show that to me later. <laughs> Okay, now, 
Uh, <laughs> every family has to have their beginning in America. Okay, so one day into his shop came a young woman who I think of as being quintessentially American. Uh, Ticey's family had gone out west on the Oregon Trail in a covered wagon. They homesteaded in Oregon. We know so much more about that American pioneer life and how difficult it was for women in particular. Ticey's mother died when she was a baby. Her father died when she was seven. She was raised by brothers who were reputed to be quite cruel to her. When she was 18, she ran away from home, couldn't afford San Francisco, ended up going to Sacramento. And it wasn't like it is today, where if you're a young woman on your own and worse comes to worse, you could go work at Starbucks or Walmart or Costco or fill in the blank. No one would hire her. And she ended up in Chinatown begging my great-grandfather for a job. And he did hire her to sell what we called in our family fancy underwear for fancy ladies. One thing led to another, and they decided to get married. And, uh, you know, in California and in 28 other states, it was against the law for Chinese and Caucasians to marry. It was against the law in California till 1948, in many other states till 1965. It was against the law for Chinese in California to own property until 1948, down to a quarter Chinese. It was against the law, of course, at the federal level, national level for Chinese to become naturalized citizens till 1943. So for these two people to get married, what they did was they went to a lawyer who drew up a contract between two people as though they were forming a partnership. My grandparents went to Mexico to get married, and my own parents when, uh, we're only the second couple in our whole extended family to be married legally here in the United States. So, eventually Fongsi and Ticey came down to Los Angeles. They stayed in the underwear business for a while, gradually curios, finally into antiques. Uh, just very quickly, I'm going to just zip through this. Uh, 1919, they go back to China on a big buying trip. Fong Si uh, sends his wife and children home after two years. Soon, Ticey intercepts a letter and discovers that her husband, who's in his 60s, had just married a 16-year-old girl who he did bring home to Los Angeles. So that gets you up to about page 120 of our family story. <laughs> but again, as I, wanted, I just want to say that my great-grandfather, he had four wives. He lived to be 100 years old. He had 12 children. Uh, he, the last one was born when he was in his 90s long before the age of Viagra, so a real accomplishment. I mean, this should give all you guys out there something to aspire to, okay? So anyway, today in Los Angeles, as I mentioned, I have 400 relatives, about a dozen who look like me, majority still full Chinese, and this spectrum in between. So how is it that we identify ourselves? We identify ourselves by the people who are around us. They're our mirror. They're the ones who tell us who we are. Now, I know many of you have read my mother, uh, her reviews in the post. Well, my mom had a very, very small family. When I was growing up, I think less than 10 people in her family. My father's side was just so overwhelming. But I think I've been able to draw from both sides, you know, to become a writer like my mother, but to have all of this material and this whole world from my father. So, that gives you a little bit of background about who I am and why I write the kinds of books that I do. Now, I thought what I would now talk about a bit is the new novel, China Dolls, and uh, give you sort of the background of that book, but also talk about, about the research that I do, because that is my favorite part. China Dolls uh, is about three girls who meet at an audition at a nightclub in San Francisco in 1938. And this was a period when there were a lot of Chinese-American nightclubs, mostly in San Francisco, one in New York called the China Doll. There were performers who were billed as the Chinese Fred Astaire and Ginger Rogers, the Chinese Frank Sinatra, the Chinese Houdini, the Chinese, you know, fill in the blank. And sometimes, because this was the nightclub era, they would travel around the country going nightclub to nightclub, and they didn't say we're going out on the Chitlin circuit. They didn't say we're going out on the Borscht Belt. They'd say we're going out on the Chop Suey circuit. <laughs> okay, so these three young women meet at this audition. 
And the first of these is Grace. She's uh, from Plain City, Ohio. She's grown up completely separated from Chinese culture, Chinese tradition. She has a family that has completely broken away, right? Broken the mold. And one of the things that I found in my research was that the majority of performers at that time uh, really did come from the Midwest or from very small towns where they had com been completely separated. Because if you had grown up in a Chinatown and you were a young woman, you weren't allowed to show your arms, bare arms and legs in public. You were supposed to stay home, learn to embroider, knit, cook, take care of children, become a good wife and mother. But if you had grown, out, uh, grown up somewhere out in the middle of the country, and you had thought you're just like any of the other girls, what would you aspire to be? Or who would you aspire to be? Shirley Temple. And so she has taken lots of dance classes and uh, circumstances arise where she has run away to San Francisco. The next of these young women is named Helen and she's grown up in a very traditional Chinese compound right in the heart of San Francisco Chinatown. Uh, this is a compound like I've written about in other books, like Snowflower and the Secret Fan or Peony and Love, you know, with a big central courtyard, generations of your family living with you. You might think there's no way something like that could have existed in, in America. Well, a couple of years ago, as I was doing the research for this, I was invited to really, I think, the best speaking gig I ever have had. It, I had to speak for one hour at Canyon Ranch, that really she, she um, spa, and in exchange they let me stay there for a week and have as many treatments as I needed or wanted. Now, I don't know why they don't ask me back every month, but okay. So one night I was at dinner and there was a woman next to me and we started talking, and it turned out she had grown up in a very traditional compound right in the heart of San Francisco. I don't know how many of you are from there, but her family owned the Fong Fong Bakery. And so all of the details about this compound really come from this woman who I met very randomly. And I thought with Helen, what would it have taken for her family to have allowed her to dance in a nightclub? What could she possibly have done? What could have been done to her that they would allow her to dance? And then the last of these is Ruby. And Ruby is actually Japanese masquerading as Chinese. When asked why she would do that, she says, well, Ethel Zimmerman looked at her name up on the marquee and thought it looked too long. And she shortened it to Ethel Merman, which is a true story. But there were other reasons why she would have done this. These were Chinese-American nightclubs. You had African-American nightclubs. You had a, the whole Borscht Belt. You had, of course, all the white nightclubs. But there really was no other place to perform if you were Asian. And so if you were Hawaiian, Japanese, Chinese, and even there was one man who was um, Portuguese who changed his name <laughs> so that he would sound Chinese. And he was a very well-known dancer. There is also something else that's different about Ruby. She has lived in three places in her life, in, in on Terminal Island, uh, just in Los Angeles, out in, uh, in uh, Honolulu, and then also in Alameda in San Francisco Bay. And these three places were very large Japanese Americans, but they also had something else in common large um, naval bases. And so I think it's pretty fair to say that sailors love Ruby and Ruby loves sailors. Now, at one point, Ruby is talking about friendship and women, and she says, A woman isn't just one thing. The past is in us, constantly changing us. Heartache and failure shift our perspectives, as do joy and triumphs. At any moment, on any given day, we can be friends, competitors, or enemies. We can be generous or stingy, loving or petty, helpful or untrustworthy. So, friends and friendship. Now, uh, just as the novel opens, Grace has just arrived in San Francisco. She doesn't even know yet about the Forbidden City nightclub or any of those nightclubs. And she applies for a job at the Golden Gate International Exhibition, which was San Francisco's second World's Fair. This World's Fair was unlike any World's Fair that had been held up until that point. The organizers, instead of asking countries from around the world 
they limited themselves only to countries that dotted the edge of the Pacific Ocean. This was the very first time that the phrase Pacific Rim was used anywhere, <coughs> anywhere, and it's, of course, it's something that's grown in importance today. And so in the main part of the fair, you had those big, beautiful pavilions for each country. You had fountains and, of course, people who were doing dance performances and music and lectures, all very elegant, all very boastful of those countries. And over here was another part of the fair called the Gay Way. The gay way was a kind of carnival atmosphere. And so you could go there and you could see the headless woman display, you could see the sword swallower. There was also a man who would swallow a neon tube so you could see all of his innards lit up. Uh, there you could go to the incubator bar and have a drink and watch babies grow. It was the first place in the world where you could see television electric razors and nylon stockings, and also Sally Rand, who had had her big splash originally at the uh, Chicago World's Fair, came to San Francisco and was doing feather dancing and bubble dancing. So all of that's happening in this, this kind of crazy part of the fair, the gay way. People were going to be coming from all over the country, all over the world, to work at this fair. People were going to be coming from all over the country, all over the world, to come and visit the fair. And so San Francisco, much like any other city, when they have a big event coming, they did a whole spruce up campaign. And San Francisco Chinatown didn't want to be left behind. And they started what was called the Shine for 39 campaign. And at the heart of that campaign was trying to get rid of these old stereotypes about Chinatown, that it was a place of opium dens, gambling, prostitution. And so by the time the fair opened, all of that has been washed away for the most part. And um, part of this whole change is to have restaurants, cafes, and again, these nightclubs. And of these nightclubs, the most famous was the Forbidden City. So I wanted to go out and find people who had maybe performed at the Forbidden City, had auditioned there, might have been there on opening night. What did they eat? What did they wear? What did they drink? Okay, so now I'm going to talk a bit about the research. Research is my favorite part of the entire process of writing. I love it. I never know what I'm going to find. This book in particular, I got to interview some really wonderful people, uh, the sons and daughters of many of the performers. Uh, the son of the Chinese Frank Sinatra, the, son, the daughter of the, ma of the man who owned the Forbidden City nightclub, another woman, Jody Long, who's an actress whose mother and father had a song and dance routine. And, and they all talked about what it was like to be a kid backstage at the Forbidden City, what it was like to sit in the back seat as their families traveled through on the chop suey circuit. They all talked about one little boy in particular who every night at the Forbidden City City would peek out the curtain at the back side, the naked side of the bubble dancer, and how he would always get in trouble. But of these people, there were a couple that I really want to highlight. One was named Mary Ong Tom. She was 93 when I interviewed her. She's 96 today. She grew up in Tucson, Arizona. No offense to Tucson, but Tucson, let's just say 90-some years ago, was not a big town. Let's just say it wasn't a big town. It was a small town. It was a dusty town. It was not really on the beaten track. And her parents were very, very poor. Her father died when she was five. Her mother had bound feet. They had a little grocery shop that was 20 by 20 square feet. She had 11 brothers and sisters, so desperately poor. And they had a family friend who said, in San Francisco who sent money and said, send Mary to me, I'll, I'll see what I can do for her. When she got to San Francisco, she was so poor that she would walk everywhere because she couldn't afford the nickel bus fare. But finally she got an audition at the Forbidden City and she was hired as one of the original eight chorus girls at the Forbidden City nightclub, uh, even though she had never had a dance lesson before. 
I interviewed another woman, Dorothy Toy, who was the Chinese Ginger Rogers. Oh, and I'm going to come to her later anyway. Just don't worry. Hold that thought about Ginger, about Dorothy. But uh, let me just tell you a bit about Mai Tai Singh. So Mai Tai, another one of these women, very difficult childhood. Uh, she had grown up, or for a while, born in Los Angeles. Her family was so poor that the whole family moved back to Hong Kong when she was five. And this must have been, she must have been a pretty interesting little girl because she kept saying to her father as a five-year-old, I love glitter, I love glitter, I need to be in Hollywood. <laughs> and he borrowed money and sent Mai Tai and her mother back to Los Angeles where they earned a living rolling paper cups at the kitchen table and selling them for two cents a dozen. By the time she was 13, she was supporting her entire family with her dancing. She brought everyone over from China. This is a woman who cut a seriously wide swath. I think she slept with every man in Hollywood and then some. For the very first book event for this book, there was a man who came through the line and he leaned in and he was like, I knew my Thai. <laughs> and you know, he did, he knew her. And then he proceeded to list, like, oh, she slept with this actor, and a two-year affair with this actor, and a really a wide swath. At one point, I asked Mai Tai, and, you know, she's now 92, I think. Uh, I asked her, so Mai Tai, you know, what was your favorite costume all the years you were dancing? And she said, oh, that's easy. Well, she didn't say it like that. So here's the thing. These are tiny, tiny women. Uh, they're in their 90s. They were Asian to begin with, so small. They came of age during the Depression, so they hadn't had very much to eat. So they're, and they were dancers their entire lives, right? I don't think one of them over 85 pounds. So tiny, tiny, they're in their cute little pantsuits. They have their cute little hairdos. But when they open their mouths, they sound like, you know, old Broadway broads. And so I asked Mai Tai, I can't even do it, but I asked Mai Tai, what was your favorite costume? And she said, oh, that, you know, oh, that's easy. It was a gown made out of 15 yards of monkey fur. <laughs> now, that's something that, as a writer, you can't make up. <laughs> and not only can you not make it up, it's actually a detail that's very, very difficult to use because, of course, today, if you sent Angelina Jolie down the red carpet in 15 yards of monkey fur, I don't care how beautiful she is and what a humanitarian she is, that would be the end of her career. So, anyway, Mai Tai, she had cut a very wide swath, and you've probably figured it out by now, but the drink, the Mai Tai, was named for her. Yeah. All right, so I have on my website a lot of links to the original performances that you, from films. Uh, this really, you're just linking to YouTube. There's uh, interviews with many of these performers, so you know, come and visit. It's a lot of fun. All right, so everything is going along swimmingly in these nightclubs when World War II breaks out and we have Pearl Harbor. And overnight in San Francisco, everything changes. Well, of course, every, overnight across the country, everything changes for everyone. But in San Francisco, the city's changed, people are changed, it's changed for Chinese Americans, for Japanese Americans. Overnight in San Francisco, on the hills surrounding the city, there are now radar towers. Uh, they had these heavy-duty um, tugboats that would pull nets from the San Francisco side to the Sausalito side so that uh, at night so that Japanese submarines wouldn't be able to come into the bay. During the day, they would send out blimps and planes to fly out past the Golden Gate Bridge looking again for Japanese submarines. They never found an actual Japanese submarine, but they did sink several whales. <laughs> this was also a big defense city and so they were building ships and tanks and um, trucks and uh, ambulances. At one point during the war, San Francisco was building a ship a day and many of the people who worked in those factories were women. That's where Rosie the Riveter was invented. So this was a tremendous change for people in San Francisco for women. 
And then it was also a liberty port. And so all the men who were shipping out to the Pacific Theater, all the men who were coming back from the Pacific Theater had to pass through San Francisco. And what do young men who think they may not have another tomorrow want? Wine, women, and song. Let's just leave it at that, okay? <laughs> Wine, women, and song. And so these clubs that had been going along just swimmingly all of a sudden really take off. Their lines around the block, packed shows three times a night. Little history lesson. So how does this change for Chinese Americans? Now that China and, Japan and, and the U.S. are allies, the Chinese Exclusion Act of 1882 can no longer stand. It's finally overturned. And this paves the way for Chinese Americans to become naturalized citizens. It paves the way for people to really know that we're going to live here forever. It's a change from the sojourner mentality to this mentality of we're Americans. And that's huge. All of the negatives that had been out there for decades about the Chinese suddenly shift to the Japanese. And one of the things that I found were articles in Time and, and in Life magazine that ran exactly two weeks after the bombing of Pearl Harbor. And both of them had almost identical articles, almost identical drawings that showed a, a figure of a man with arrows pointing at different parts of his body. And this I have to read. Uh, in Life magazine, they said they were, quote, encouraging our readers to overcome their distressing ignorance on the delicate question of how to tell the difference between a Chinese and a Japanese. <clears throat> and so these arrows pointed out the differences. A Chinese can grow to five foot five, but a Japanese can only top out at five foot two. A Chinese can, uh, can't grow hair on his chest, but you can identify a Japanese by his mustache. A Chinese has parchment yellow skin, which doesn't sound too bad, uh, but a Japanese is identifiable by his earthy, dirty, yellow-looking skin. And then, finally, uh, again, the Chinese who had for decades looked inscrutable now, and again I'm going to read this, you could recognize a Chinese by their placid, kindly, and open expressions, while a Japanese can be counted on to laugh loudly at exactly the wrong time. You could not have a mainstream magazine or newspaper write something like that today, but the fear and the paranoia was so great in that time period that this uh, obviously leads to internment. So I just uh, wanted to say that um, w as I was looking at internment, we had had a lot of people in our family who were interned. My, my father and my grandparents, they took care of the home of the Oki family during the war when they were interned at Manzanar so that when that family came out after the war, they had their house, they had their car, they had their possessions but most Japanese Americans lost everything. So I wanted to find performers who had been in this situation, what happened to them. And so I did interview Dorothy Toy, the Chinese Ginger Rogers, now 97 years old. And she had made it through most of the war as the Chinese Ginger Rogers. She had had that identity for so long that no one questioned it, no one doubted it. And so when but when she got a big part in a film, and she and her partner went down to Los Angeles, one of her friends ratted her out because she wanted to have that role in the film. And the FBI came to Dorothy and they said, we understand that you're famous, so we're going to give you a choice. Either we will send you to the internment camp with your family, or you need to leave the state. And she chose to leave the state, and she spent the rest of the war traveling through the South with her sister, a singer, where they went club to club, where Dorothy said to me, they'd never seen a Chinese, they'd never seen a Japanese, they couldn't tell the difference, we knew we'd be safe. China Dolls is my ninth book. I like to think, I hope, that I've improved as a writer. I've been trying to follow three ideas with my writing. The first is that art is the heartbeat of the artist. This was something that the Chinese women poets of the 17th century really believed, that art is the heartbeat of the artist. And these words that I write, in these books that I write, they are my heartbeat. Those same women poets 
They also believe that you have to cut to the bone to write. And if you've read any of my books, you know that there are some pretty sad parts in there. Some really tough things happen. And I don't wake up in the morning and think, you know, oh, goody, I get to kill off beautiful moon. No, it's very hard for me. And sometimes it's a single scene, sometimes like in Dreams of Joy, you know, where it's a long time, months of my writing where I'm in this very, very dark place. So it's not easy for me, but I do believe you have to go there as a writer. And then lastly, is a quote from William Stegner. And I use this as the epigraph for On Gold Mountain, my first book, the one about my family. <clears throat> and when I used this, I didn't realize that these were the words and this was the sentiment that I was going to keep working towards all the way to today. He wrote, fooling around in the papers, my grandparents, especially my grandmother, left behind. I get glimpses of lives close to mine related to mine in ways I recognize but don't completely comprehend. I'd like to live in their clothes for a while. And that's what I've been trying to do with my work, is just live in their clothes for a while. And for me, that's been an honor and a privilege. Thank you. Thank you. So the questions are where that nice green man is, or he's a man in a green shirt. <laughs> While we're waiting, somebody could raise their hand and I could repeat the question if it's too hard to get up. Yes. How do I like Pearl Buck's books? Now try saying that 20 times. <laughs> Uh, I, of course, read The Good Earth, and I read it, I think, in high school, and I thought that that was a, just an amazing book. Um, I can't say that I've written very, read anything else really written by her, uh, but I have done a lot of research about her life, and I think her life is pretty extraordinary, and uh, she was a wonderful writer. Yes. What advice do I have for a beginning writer? Uh, really two pieces. Uh, one comes from my mother, which actually came from her father, which is to write a thousand words a day. This is just four typed pages. Uh, I always say you have to do it before anything else. There are a million distractions out there in the world, a million ways and reasons not to write, right? I mean, washing dishes, cleaning the bathroom tile. I mean, there are a lot of reasons not to sit down and do your work. But if you can just sit down and do that first thousand words a day, then you still have the rest of the day open to you. For me, sometimes I can do that in two hours, sometimes it takes me 10. Um, but if I do that first, then I, can, I know I can go to sleep with a good conscience. If when you're starting out, maybe you can't do four pages, then you just do 500 words. That's just two pages. Anybody could write two pages in a day. And by the end of the week, you would have 10 pages. By the end of the month, or two weeks, you would have a chapter. So that's number one. And then the other is to really be passionate about what you're writing. This isn't a one-night stand. You know, it really is like a marriage. And you'd better really care about what you're writing because there are a lot of downsides to writing. There are a lot of tough parts of writing. Um, there are a lot of things that, uh, you know, might be emotional for you to go through. There's also that outside stuff that happens like, oh, maybe somebody writes a really mean review about your book. So there's some really tough things that happen. Ron is shaking his head no. But, uh, you know, there are tough things that can happen along the way. And so you'd better be really, really passionate because I think that passion and that real love, and you could also call it an obsession, is what will get you through the times that are difficult and make it so that you think, okay, I can sit down and write my thousand words. I'd like oh. to ask a very politically incorrect question, so if you'll please forgive me. How do you respond to the question that you don't really look Chinese? 
Well, I, see, I talked about that at the beginning. So I don't know, maybe you came in a little late, but I, you know, I've been hearing that question just really as long as I can remember. And I, actually it's interesting, I was just interviewed um, in some other room earlier today. And uh, one of the themes, it seems to me, that's really emerging out of this particular convention, this particular book festival, is the issue of diversity. And I, you know, my family was intermarrying when it was against the law. And I, I mean, we've had generations of it. And I now, I'm now a grandmother. And my uh, grandson is half Persian and a quarter Jewish. And then the other quarter is, you know, this weird, the interesting mix that I am uh, that really is, has some Spanish, some Scottish, some English, some Irish, some Native American, and the Chinese. So here's the little boy. He's got a little of everything in him. But when he gets to school and people ask him, what part of his family does he identify with? I don't know. Will I be able to tell by looking at his face? Would his teacher be able to tell by looking at his face what part of his family he identifies with? And I think that this is something that we have happening in all of our families across the country. That maybe my family was on sort of the, you know, the first wave of that, but we're right now in it. And when you, I go to colleges, when I go to elementary schools, I see that. I see these world faces. And that is the face of America now. And you can't... Fascinating. Excellent answer. Yeah. Yes. Are you going to write a fourth mystery novel? I've been waiting. Oh. <laughs> Thank you so much. So, uh, I, you know, a lot of people ask me that. And uh, for the people who don't know that I wrote these mysteries, um, my, uh, I, yeah, they're really great. Can I say that? They're really great. Yes. And, and uh, they're sort of based on the fact that many years ago, my, I'm going to answer your question, don't worry. Um, but many years ago, my husband represented China when they would have legal problems in the United States. And so there was this time period where we were going to China a lot, and we were, this was right after Tiananmen. I know there's a Tiananmen conversation going on in another room right even as we speak uh, about the massacre. But this was the winter after that. And um, my husband had this case where it was the first time that the FBI and the Ministry of Public Security, China's version of the FBI, had ever worked together. And so we would have these evenings in these karaoke bars with these agents from the Ministry of Public Security. And there was this one night, we're in this karaoke bar, and let me just say this, uh, you know, they're drinking, like music, of course, and they're drinking this horrible con uh, con drink of orange juice and cognac. They're drinking, they're smoking decadent foreign cigarettes, Marlboros. And, um, but what I can tell you is it doesn't matter where you go in the world, people in law enforcement basically all look alike. <laughs> they have their black leather jackets, they've got a particular physical build, they've got their weapons, they've got their tough guy attitudes across the world. But these guys, they were getting up and they were singing the most sappy love songs. <laughs> in the most gorgeous tenor voices, with the tears coming down their cheeks. And if you're a writer, there is only one thing you can think. This is the best material and I've got it. <laughs> and so that's how those books started. And uh, I actually have been asked this question so many times in emails that I even have sort of a standard reply, which is, Oh, poor David and Hulan, they've been through so much, so they're kind of on vacation. I like to think of them on a tropical beach. There's, you know, nice palm trees. They're drinking those drinks with the little umbrellas. Just let them be for a while. So I sent that out one time, and I got an email back right away. I see it. You know, this one right, I see it. I see the ocean. I see the beach, I see the palm trees, they're drinking those little drinks, and a big old bloated dead body washes up on the beach right in front of them. 
So that could happen. I don't know. Yes. Hi, Lisa. Um, it was lovely to meet you last night, and I'm coming here with a different hat on. So I write a blog called I'm Not the Nanny. My children are biracial. And for me personally growing up, I had a hard time finding books that resonated with my particular Asian American experience. And I'm trying really hard to find books that will resonate for my children. Now, I'm assuming when you were growing up, there weren't a lot of stories that the resonated story with your Ping. family. That was it, I think. <laughs> but I, I, you know, I was just curious, what stories have you read you know, in the past or recently that resonated with your family and their cultures? I, I mean, I don't know that there is that fits my family because, I mean, I, I just don't see it. And we, when my, grand, bring up my grandson again, because, you know, I'm a grandmother, what can you do? Um, on his first birthday, my daughter-in-law wanted a photographer to come and take pictures. And her family, they looked so homogeneous, you know? They just all looked alike. And then my family, it, it really was this kind of cross-section of America, you know, African-American and chi really Chinese-looking and people like me and, all, and my husband's family. It's all this whole mix. And I just don't see that there are books out there that really address that uh, in terms of characters or really even plot. But I don't know that you need that. I just think, you know, what's at the heart of stories, really? family, friendships, the, you know, love, these are the things that we are universal and it shouldn't really matter if it's a good story, everyone should be able to relate to it. I mean, on the surface, it sounded like you all read Snowflower and the Secret Fan. You don't really have anything in common with bound-footed women in the mid-19th century, 18th century in a small village in China who communicate through a secret language what you connected to was the friendship, and that's the universal. So I, I don't, I mean, I wish there were more books out there like that, but I, I don't know how, you know, who's doing them. Okay, I think we have time for one more. Tracy? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Lisa, I think for your uh, grand, grandson, what they can say, I don't have a grandson yet, but my son is also biracial, is that we are uniting the gene pools of the world. Yes, that's, that's true. <laughs> right. Um, the question for you is uh, thinking about um, Mary Ong Tong, Tom, that you mentioned, who you mentioned grew up in Tucson. I grew up in Oklahoma with no other Asian people around me. Um, would you consider writing a book about the uh, about different people in the Chinese diaspora who grew up in places like that, not in San Francisco, not in in New York City, in Chinatown, but kind of in these all these outlying places and kind of that experience of right. them coming together. Well, I mean, I think China Dolls, a good third of it is about that, you know, because it's following Grace, who did grow up with that experience. And I think there are some interesting books, uh, novels. Oh, I just have to remember, I'm just, it, Nina Revore, who's um, actually Japanese-American, uh, her, but she's half Japanese and half, like, German-American and grew up in a very small town. I think she's a fabulous writer, uh, Wing Shooter, Wing something, I can't remember the title, but one of my very favorite books ever was written by her, and I can't remember the title of that either, so you're just going to have to go look her up, because um, it's just dry, I'm just drawing a blank. But I think there are books out there if you can, you just have to keep looking and scratching away, and I think there's some other authors here this weekend who have, have written about that. So you just have to keep looking, and they're out there, but you have to be persistent. OK, thank you all so much. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.